Writing a piece for orchestra is one of the most challenging things a composer gets to do. You're faced with 70 odd instruments, 20 different kinds of instrument, each with their own challenges, features, things that make them shine, things that make them sound better or worse. And then there are all the ways you can mix and blend those instruments into different combinations. So how do you go about figuring all this out? Well today we're going to look at a piece by the French composer Maurice Ravel and we'll look at a small piano piece he wrote in 1905 called Alborado del Gracioso. What's useful about this piece is that about 15 years after he wrote it, Ravel orchestrated it. So it's about as good a chance as you're going to get, I think, to have a look at how someone who's often considered the king of orchestration goes about turning notes written for the black and white keys of the piano into the full technicolor of the orchestra. So we'll look at the piano piece and firstly try to imagine how we would do it ourselves, what the logical choices would be. And then we'll overlay on that foundation the little splashes of magic that Ravel adds, those tricks that make all the difference. And I hope even if you have no plans yourself to orchestrate anything, you'll still find this an interesting look behind the scenes at how something like this is put together. Ravel was born in a little place called Cibor, near Biarritz, part of the French Basque region, and just 11 or so miles from the Spanish border. And although he's French, I think he can justifiably claim a strong Spanish heritage. His mum was Basque and grew up in Madrid, and Ravel recalled loving what he called the Guajeras, a sort of Cuban Spanish folk style of music that she sang to him as a child. Ravel's father, on the other hand, came from Switzerland and was an inventor and industrialist. He actually made one of the first internal combustion engines. And something of his father's meticulous craftsmanship may have rubbed off on Maurice, whom Stravinsky later dubbed the Swiss watchmaker of composers. So this piece, in many ways, is a perfect combination of the two sides of Ravel's heritage. It's packed with Spanish influence, but it also displays the intricate mechanisms of a precision machine. The opening very much captures the Spanish flavour. The rhythm is a typically Spanish mixture of 6, 8 and 3, 4. In fact, it's a key feature of the Guajira that Ravel talked about. If you listen to the tune in the lower hand, you get a strong sense of 3, 4. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. And then you get these contrasting accents picking out the 6, 8 time. 1 and 2 under, 1 and 2 under. It's also full of allusions to flamenco music and that most Spanish of instruments, the guitar. The texture itself is very guitar-like, a plucked staccato melody with accompanying syncopated chords. And the chords are also very typical of flamenco music with clashing intervals known as flat nines and sharp nines. And you get that flamenco sound. Right now, I'm just playing an E major triad with a flat nine. Okay. Notice how all the chords are rolled to underline the guitar-like effect. Ravel marks them as très serré, which means very tight, very short. Again, this may be to imitate the flamenco guitar effect known as rasguiado, where you sort of flick the strings with your fingernails. And you get that flamenco sound. So this is all giving us a flavour and a pointer as to the direction we should take the orchestration in. It makes sense to start with some kind of pizzicato strings to really emulate that plucked guitar effect. Personally, I always like the pizzicato on the A string of the cello. It's quite a focused and punchy sound, so I might have put the main melody line there. But we've also got two harps in our orchestra, so we can double some of the lines on the harp, and it will give the pizzicato some extra ring, some extra resonance, and also a very nice tone to the melody. We're not really used to harps playing the melody line, that often. And then if you were doing something very simply you would split the three notes of those chords between the upper strings and that would probably work fine. But we've not yet managed to capture more of that guitar-like strum and this is where Ravel's orchestration really comes into its own. Look at this chord, for example, on the second violins. It's just three different Ds. You've got the open D string, which always has a sort of extra ringing quality. Then you've got a D stopped on the G string and a higher D on the A string. It all sits very comfortably to play. But what it means is you can play all of these Ds at once by strumming across the strings and it really produces more of that guitar-y effect, especially when the whole section of strings plays it.
So when I look back at the Ravel orchestration, it was also fascinating to see that he didn't actually use the cello for his main melody. He put it on the violin and half of the viola, still doubled on the harp. And this, by comparison, gives the whole thing a lighter texture. I think mine might have been quite heavy, whereas there's a sort of soft precision charm to it being in the upper strings. And one other tiny little detail to mention at the end of this section is the high bassoon doing that embellished run at the end. It just adds a sort of sweet comical touch Next we come to perhaps one of the most notable sections of orchestration in the whole piece, which is these extremely fast repeated notes. And on the piano, these still cause a fair amount of trepidation amongst performers. Ravel himself apparently used a piano which had a much lighter touch than more modern pianos, so this kind of figuration is harder to play today than it was for Ravel. And it feels quite remarkable to hear it in the orchestra, particularly because the sound is so continuous. This is achieved with a cunning overlapping of instruments, so with a bit of luck you don't notice where one starts and the other ends. It's obviously an effect that was designed to create a bit of a wow factor, to create something so fragile that it only really holds together through the sheer technical brilliance of the players. One of the big challenges of creating an interesting orchestration is to tread that fine line and find that exact moment just before the possible becomes the impossible, the playable becomes unplayable. In many cases you might find yourself writing something that's never even been tried before and you should expect some of the less adventurous minded players to give you a lot of grief and maybe even tell you you're incompetent, you don't know what you're doing. Now this repeated note effect is pretty challenging on most instruments but I think it's particularly challenging on the harp, which Ravel also adds here very subtly in the background. I've seen some players kind of bluff this and fake it, just playing duplets instead of triplets. So I'm sure this is one of those areas Ravel thought very carefully about how close to that line he was pushing himself. Next, let's look at combining instruments and focus on a single sound that happens at the end of this section. Well, it's a chord in two parts. It's basically a boom thwack sound. It's already quite interesting how it's laid out. The foundation of the chord comes from this deep D and A down in the bass. And then in the second part, the root note is removed and we're left with what's called a first inversion chord with F sharps at the bottom and lots of Ds and As at the top. So if I was orchestrating this, I might start with, well, obviously a bass drum and maybe a cymbal on the second whack. The Ds and As would be fairly easy to add on the bassoons, the low brass and the low strings. And then to fill in the notes, I would probably put that little run on just the piccolo because it's amazing how much the piccolo stands out even when you have a full orchestra. It would just be a very nice little whoosh into the main chord. And then I would probably make mainly Ds and As in the woodwind, uh, keep a first inversion kind of layout in the horns and the brass, and something similar in the strings. Orchestrating a big chord like this can seem a bit daunting, but it's important to remember that some notes are much more important than others. So here it would be important to balance the brass section as a whole. Probably each instrument would be playing in their comfortable higher mid range. And these will be the most prominent sounds you'll hear, together with the high end of the woodwinds, particularly high clarinets or flutes and piccolos, they'll all come through. And if you get those right, the chord should sound pretty good regardless of what else you do because even though there are a lot of strings, a loud brass and percussion hit can easily drown out an entire string section. So there's my attempt. Now let's compare it to Ravel. So it's reasonably close. The brass chord is very similar. And so is the woodwind. But there are two things that stand out to me. Firstly, this fascinating chord in pizzicato on the first violins, which has the open D and A string, and then a very high A. Now, I would have said that the open strings will completely drown out that high A. I'm not totally convinced this comes through in the texture, but I will bow to Ravel's superior knowledge. And second is the percussion. I should have thought of this sooner because one of the golden rules of percussion in many cases is never use one sound where multiple will do. 
It always seems to sound a bit better if you double up a percussive hit with several instruments. So where I just used a bass drum, Ravel added a timpani, a kind of double whack. And where I just used a cymbal, Ravel adds a triangle, a tambourine, castanets of course to give it that sort of Spanish flavour, a military drum with a little roll beforehand and another timpani strike. So you end up with all these instruments all doing this one hit. To bring out the oldest cliché in the music book, it's comparable to cooking. You want a multi-layered, complex taste that gives you nuance to your palate. You don't just want one sound, one symbol. You put them all together and the overall result is much more richer and more interesting. And then comes the main middle section of the piece, which is these long solo lines accompanied by schmoozy schmaltzy chords. For the solo line, I think Ravel was thinking of this kind of Spanish vocal singing known as the cante hondo, the deep song. Which instrument would you choose to emulate this kind of sound? Well, Ravel went for bassoon, which I think is a genius choice. It has a sort of nasal quality and a mixture of tenderness and melancholy, which I think works wonderfully. The gracioso of the title is a Spanish word roughly meaning jester, so the morning song of the jester is one translation. So Ravel may also have been playing on the stereotypical role of the bassoon as the comical instrument of the orchestra, but I have to say it's such a lyrical passage, you don't feel much of a sense of silliness in particular, especially when it's joined by the passionate cellos later on. So these lyrical melody lines are interrupted with those schmoozy chords. We'll look at this first one here. It's basically a B minor 9, so B, D, F sharp, A and C sharp. But it's arranged in this quite jazzy spacing with the ninth at the bottom. And particularly when you have this gentle bass line, it has almost a bossa nova kind of feel, even though that's a style that wasn't invented for another 40 years or so. So let's see, we might put these on the harps and maybe a xylophone just to pick out the top note. And yes, Ravel does this as well, although he also continues the doubling of percussion, adding the military drum and a pinging crotal just to kick each chord off. But Ravel wanted to go a stage further by adding some of the sustained sound that you get from the piano pedal. and he achieves this with a huge divisi of the orchestral string parts. If you look at older scores by composers like Beethoven or Mozart, you tend to get one part for all of the first violins, and another part for the second violins, and one for each of the viola, cello and basses. Occasionally you might split a part into two, which is what divisi usually refers to. But Ravel goes much further. The strings are actually subdivided so that the first violins are separated into six different lines, and so are the seconds. The violas into five, the cellos into four, and the basses into three. He separates out all of the eight notes of that upper chord, and half of the strings play that as a pizzicato, adding yet another layer of flavour to the percussive part of the sound, and half play it as a bowed, sustained background sound. And almost all of these held notes are string harmonics, and where possible they're natural harmonics, which is a note that you can play by just lightly touching the string at certain points to make a higher pitch. What's interesting about these is that you can't really play vibrato on them because the harmonic only sounds at that particular point. So if you wobble your finger to make the vibrato, the harmonic will just disappear. So it's a good way of producing this kind of ice cool sustained sound, which when warmed by those plucked and percussive sounds is a great combination. So I hope you found that an interesting look at a really beautiful little piece and something that's a really great lesson in orchestration if you want to take the time to have a look at it. If you'd like to support the channel, do please consider joining my patrons over at Patreon. If you enjoyed the video, do check out my other videos and consider subscribing. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you next time.